Testing one, two, three. This will be the August 20th, 2014 City Council regular meeting. Everybody ready? Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call to order a regular city council meeting of the city of Satellite Beach, August 20th, 2014, approximately 7 p.m. Please join Vice Mayor Gott for a moment of silence and the pledge. Please join me for a moment of silence. Thank you. Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item three, citizens' comments. This is for non-agenda items. Mayor? Let me get set up here real quick if you don't mind. No problem. I bring a clock with me nowadays. Um, Steve Headley, resident. During the August 6th meeting, conspicuously absent from the agenda was an agenda that's typically an agenda item that is typically seen on city council meetings, the report from the city attorney. As such, there was no comments or reports given by Mr. Beadle at that time. Agenda item 10 was described as, quote, an agenda item for agenda items for next regular council meeting. Under that agenda item, Mayor Catino asked for a report from the city attorney, Jim Beadle, regarding the sign issue that I have been patiently trying to get addressed for the last two years. Why the report from Mr. Beadle was under this item is a mystery. At the prior city council meeting, Mr. Beadle was tasked to, quote, come back and talk to us, unquote, on the sign ordinance, and not just specifically to report on whether the sign ordinance should appear on the agenda for the 20, August 20th meeting. Nonetheless, Mr. Beadle gave his report on talking with a person at a conference on the issue. The city council then decided not to take up the issue. The unapproved minutes say the reason was this reason was since there is, quote, no one definitive law on this subject that will require changing the code, unquote. The city council operates under a set of modified Roberts rules of orders. One of the Roberts stipulations that if a staff member or support is going to give a report on an agenda item, that report should be listed on the agenda prior to the meeting. That did not happen here. Furthermore, Mayor Catino said he could not make a motion on the agenda item. This is curious as according to city council policies and procedures, the agenda for a meeting shall be prepared by the city manager in conference with the mayor, thus eliminating the need for any motion on agenda items from the mayor at the time. It is therefore arguable that the city council violated its own rules on this issue. However, while the statement, since there is no definitive law on the subject that would require changing the code, may be correct in the summation of Mr. Beale's conversation with an unknown attorney and under unknown circumstances, the fact of the matter is that there is a clear violation of the law which the city code violates. In June of 1994, the Supreme Court decided the case of the city of Ladue versus Margaret Gilio. The city of Ladue, Missouri had a restriction on signs that included the number of free expression signs as well as an outright ban on signs and windows. Satellite Beach has similar restrictions on free expression signs as well as an outright ban on window signs in residential areas while allowing window signs in commercial areas. In its unanimous Supreme Court decision, Justice Stevens noted, quote, Gilio amended her complaint to challenge new ordinance which explicitly prohibits window signs like hers. The district court held the ordinance unconstitutional and the Court of Appeals affirmed. Relying on the plurality of the opinion in Metro Media versus San Diego, the Court of Appeals held the ordinance invalid as content-based regulation because the city treated commercial speech more favorable than non-commercial speech and favored some kinds of non-commercial speech over others. Stevens then moved to say, Ledoux, however, continues 
that its ordinance is a mere regulation of the time, place, or manner of speech because residents remain free to convey their desired messages by other means, such as, such as beep beep, sorry, such as letters, handbills, flyers, telephones, calls, newspaper advertisements, bumper stickers, speeches, and neighborhood or community meetings. However, even regulations that do not foreclose an entire medium of expression, but merely shift the time, place, or matter of its use must, quote, leave open ample alternative channels for, uncommun for communication, unquote. In this case, we are not persuaded that an adequate substitute exists for the important medium of speech that Ledoux has closed off. Continuing from the decision, displaying a sign from one owner's residence often carries a message quite distinct from placing the sign, the same sign someplace else, or conveying the same text or picture, texture, picture, by other means. Precisely because of their location, such signs provide information about the identity of the speaker. Ledoux's argument was similar to that offered by the council on the city's ability to restrict times, restrict signs on time, place, and manner. That specific argument was rejected by the Supreme Court. Councilman Montanero also offered the idea of restricting signs on the basis of aesthetics. The court addressed this as well, saying, it bears mentioning that individual residents themselves have a strong incentive to keep their own property values up and to prevent visual clutter in their own yards and neighborhoods, incentives markedly different from those persons who erect signs on others' lands and others' neighborhoods or on public property. Residents' self-interest diminishes the, law, the danger of unlimited proliferation of residential signs that concerns the city of Ladue. Okay. I'm almost Just five minutes. I'll give you a 20 seconds. Okay. I'm done. The Supreme Court struck down the ban on window signs as well as addressed the other signs. For my purpose, I only need to show that there is a law, a definitive law, that clearly demonstrates the city's current bans on signs is unconstitutional. The city's restriction on window signs is contrary to the Supreme Court ruling. This is not a matter of conjecture. This is not a matter of opinion. This is not a matter where we need to consult another unnamed attorney. It's flat Thank out wrong. Me. Thank you. Appreciate your input. Any further comment, citizens' comments, while the floor is still open? Okay, hearing none, close the citizens' comments and Mr. come. Mr. Mayor, I want to correct a misstatement that was made, a couple of misstatements. Um, under Robert's rules, uh, which we follow unless we have policies specifically to the contrary, Robert's rules say that if you have an agenda item that has no item to it, then it shouldn't be on the agenda. And that's why the attorney, uh, the city attorney's report came off of there. When he does have a report, he will let the city manager know and it will go back on. Um, Florida law says that an agenda does not need to list every item that will be discussed at a meeting. Mr. Beadle was called on to <clears throat> give us the information regarding the um, attorney's conference um, that he attended at the time that we were uh, deciding what our next agenda would be. So there was nothing inappropriate that was done by this council. We are not violating our own policies, and that's the fact. Okay. Thank you. Uh, moving on to agenda item four, citizen <coughs> city council comments. Like start, Mark. Okay. Um, just want to thank the city for the opportunity to go to the Florida League of Cities meeting, which was last week. I attended on the 14th and the 15th, and was involved in the uh, uh, committee on taxation. And I'm not going to comment a whole lot on that because I, I know we have an agenda item on this uh, regarding medical marijuana. But the taxation issue, how it's going to be collected, how it's going to be dispersed is a huge issue in the state of Florida. Um, there's a lot of ideas out there, and I'll kind of talk about some of those later. But that's, that's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention uh, the passing of Mr. Vince Bellamo. Um, I know a number of us uh, knew him and worked with him over the years. Um, Vince was a um, terrific contributor to our city, serving on a number of boards. I know that when I first got started in the city, um, he was um, on the board that I was um, appointed to. And I can recall that I used to appreciate his comments um, because he was a very wise and reasonable man. And um, we will miss him. Thank you. Any other business? That's it. Okay. 
Um, just to follow up on Lorraine's, actually Vince was a councilman in Satellite Beach for a few years and served as one of, as a vice mayor at, at one point in time. Also, another passing in Satellite Beach was Ernie Hartman. Ernie Hartman was Ed Hartman's father. And Ernie passed away uh, yesterday, I believe, yesterday or the day before also. So we've lost, um, you know, two, two people who were instrumental in our city. Also, um, Mr. Garino passed away. Um, he lived in our city at one point in time, and we actually did a uh, commemoration for him in ninth, for his 90th birthday. But he was a, uh, a fighter pilot. He was a, uh, a downed pilot and was a prisoner of war for, I believe, seven years. And he passed away the day before yesterday also. So we lost three, three people that um, were instrumental in Satellite Beach's governance and just in our history. So let's see. On the ninth, I went to the Keeper of Our Beautiful Cleanup, and you know Ethan and his mom were there again, and they had another 30 some odd people. And I'm I'm just amazed that I got phone calls, I got emails from this young man, and uh, it's, he does this with all his people, and it's amazing the people that go out there and help him. I also attended the uh, Jackie Burns um, dedication in Gleason Park for the playground equipment that Indian Harbor Beach um, purchased and um, named and dedicated on Jackie's behalf, and um, that was excellently done. They, you know, did a, a wonderful job. The uh, playground equipment down there is, like, it would be great if they had adult playground equipment like that because, you know, it looked like it would be fun to play on. Courtney's daughter had a great time on it. Piper was out there playing. Along with Mark and the mayor and the city manager, I also attended the Florida League of Cities um, annual uh, conference down in Hollywood, and... Uh, I attended a lot of seminars and policy committee meetings. Mine was the transportation. There's a, there's a lot of different things that are going on in the state. And one of the seminars that I went to, and I think this was the one that probably stood out most for me, was the sea level rise um, seminar. And there were three PhDs that were there. Um, all of them were from South Florida. One was from the University of Miami. One was from FIT. The other one, I believe, was from NOVA. Or not FIT, but FIU. And um, the first person who got up and spoke was the man from the University of Miami. And a lot of what they were talking about was geared toward Dayton Broward County, but it affects the state of Florida when you look at the big picture of what's happening. But he mentioned um, in his first opening remarks that um, most of us have 30 year mortgages on our homes. And, you know, if we pay off our 30 year mortgage and live there for another 10 years or so, and we go to sell that home, the people that are buying those homes behind us, taking out a 30-year loan, will probably never be able to live in their house in certain parts of Dayton, Broward County, those 30 years. That's how fast they're anticipating parts of Dayton, Broward County being affected by sea level rise. So that was pretty telling. Um, I also attended the Space Coast League of Cities Board in general meeting uh, on the 11th. And... Um, Courtney discussed with uh, all of the participants that were there in the municipalities in Brevard County that we, are on, we were going to be on the agenda at the county commission meeting for our first responder money. And we are on the agenda for next Tuesday at 1030, I believe. Is that correct? And um, we're hoping that a lot of the elected officials from Brevard County come out to address um, that issue with the county commission. So um, that's all I have. Thank you very much. As some of you might know, qualifying ended today for the city of Satellite Beach for the council race. And there were two seats open and only two people applied to run. And I congratulate Steve Osmer and Dominic. And as of this time, there will be no election for the candidates in Satellite Beach. It's, um, they were the two that stepped forward. And thank you for doing that. And we learned that today at 430 when it closed. So congratulations to both of you. I also attended Jackie Burns' um, for the thing at the uh, park. The dedication was done really, really well. The park's really, really nice over there. They did a great job on it. Um, also, I attended Space Coast League of Cities and also the Florida League of Cities, where I sit on the environment board and water board and a few things that are going to 
be coming up. The federal government is changing how they classify federal waters. And I think this is going to be something that's going to be really important to stay up on. Um, things that you would have no idea that would ever be considered federal waters could be now considered federal waters, and we'd have to get permits for the federal government to do things. And uh, the response from the Florida League of Cities will need to be back by October 1st. So, Alan, the uh, information I handed it to Courtney, and I think it's something we really need to stay up on. We also last night had um, school board superintendent in town at the Schechter Center to give the presentation on the half cent sales tax. He did a wonderful job. And if you haven't seen him, the presentation, it's well worth seeing the presentation. Um, very interesting. And I, I learned a lot from it every time I get to see it. But he'll be given more around if you have questions on it. Um, and I think uh, that's all I have. And moving on to agenda item five, city manager's report. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> um, the school sales tax form was a great um, thing that we did for our community. I was kind of surprised at um, the small attendance. Actually, we did advertise that in the Beachcaster, and we advertised it on our sign in front of the DRS Center. Um, I think at some point he has been, I think he said it's like the hundredth time he's been out, over a hundred presentations he's made throughout the community, so that some of the community members may have already seen it. Um, I do have a copy of his presentation that we will be, you know, putting up on our website, and I will be bringing out some of the points that he made and putting it on our Facebook page, because I do think it's important for our <coughs> citizens to realize what's at stake um, in terms of that sales tax. One of the questions he did answer were, um, was the, the thing, the, uh, an answer to a question I get consistently is, um, you know, when are they going to start sea park improvements because of the de decline of that facility is, has been so drastic. And they are, if you look at their facility plan, which they did produce a, a large plan of how they're going to spend that sales tax dollar um, amount. And that, that plan is very detailed. It took them months to put together because they did a, a facility survey of each facility in, their enti in the entire county. Um, the the Sea Park list of improvements are there. He did answer that they will be beginning those improvements just like any other school. Um, so that was a lot of the concern was, um, you know, will they actually fix up Sea Park? And, and yes, they are planning on doing that. Um, back to school begins on obviously already began <laughs> on Monday. Um, to lead into that is the first informational item that I have for you, and that's the crossing guard um, kind of problem solving that our police department did. We got a request from a resident in the Chevy Chase area um, to, re to put back that crossing guard. As you recall, we took that away because there just wasn't enough students using it to justify um, that, that location. Um, but our police department, I, I gave you a description on how they handled it because I thought, it, you know, that's just a, such a classic satellite beach way of handling a problem. Um, they went out and, and sent out 150 letters to those residents, did a survey of who would actually use it. And then they, they also began questioning the residents of Fountain, um, of the uh, um, Fountain Boulevard area. And they realized that they could combine that crossing guard into Jackson, and it's worked very well so far. So um, that's why you see that change. And it's also interesting to note that they could do that because of the improvements that we have done on South Patrick Drive to enable the kids to walk to school safely. So I thought that was a good, a good thing that um, we were able to do. Um, if you noticed a theme of my city manager report, uh, there was like a month of thank you notes to the point where I didn't include them all. I just picked the best ones in the packet. Um, one of the first ones is one from our public, for our public works department staff um, from a resident that uh, turned in a complaint and they came and addressed it um, and they got a, a good thank you note about the crew responding to the issue and the, the members were Phil Kleins, John here, Jay Verbrick, uh, Random Shell, and Steve Torres. Um, it's not often we get um, long descriptions of thank you notes like that, and I thought that they did a great job. I also wanted to give you some updates that the Public Works Department, in addition to all of their typical everyday maintenance, currently are, re are replacing or filling in a lot of potholes right now. Um, and they had a delay in getting asphalt, so they're, they're starting that process now. But um, they did repair half the intersection at Hamlin and Kale. 
Um, they repaired several storm drains, um, including um, and then also a major transformer uh, due to a lightning strike at the Soto ball field. We did finally finish the new football field improvements over at the sports park and put up new goalposts at the Soto practice field. And if you notice how pretty the fire department looks, it's because they got that done and they pressure washed that and painted it. So that just wanted to, t to kind of describe how busy they've been. Um, this is a busy time of year for them because it's the rainy season, so we get a lot of pipe breaks and a lot of potholes at this point. I did want to um, point out that we did get a thank you note for the fire department for their response to a medical call. And literally, this is one out of five we get a month. <laughs> um, so I think that's very telling of this level of service that our fire department provides to our community. Again, they're, you know, they, not only do we get the thank you for um, saving our lives, but even the small things like, you know, you fix my broken arm and things like that, they get the thank you notes for the, how well they were treated when they, when they responded. And again, we got another thank you note for our police department um, for their response to a citizen concern. So uh, it just kind of overall shows the great job our staff does on a daily basis. Um, before I get into the last, I'll stop you for just a moment. Um, could you start uh, providing copies of all of these thank you notes yeah. to the council? Because mm -hmm. I, I, I think we'd love to see them. Yep. <clears throat> Um, before I get started on the last item and, and ask the fire department staff to come up, I wanted to let you know, and this is a very ex um, exciting news. As you recall, we submitted an application to the TPO for the A1A project, and that was an application to put us in the queue for funding, um, and we did get funding. <laughs> Uh, we got a lot of funding, actually. Um, the design cost for the new A1A improvements, um, just the increase of des in the design cost. FDOT engineering designs are very expensive. And that increase in design cost is $205,000, and the TPO is covering that cost. Wow. Um, and then also, they are providing us with $576,931 of transportation alternative funds um, for your fiscal year 15-16 for the construction of those improvements. Um, so that's a big deal for us because it saves us a lot of money and allows us to use our money in, in those additional things that the resurfacing project won't cover. Okay. So that was great news. That was a good, um, thank you, John, for doing all the work with that. <laughs> um, it was a good move for us to, to become involved in the TPO, and that, that helps us get, you know, that important, puts us in the queue for those funds. And the, the other good part of that is Cocoa Beach got also funds for the, the same thing, so we're getting that connection with our sister cities and, and transportation. Um, I'm going to go ahead and invite the chief up, and we, we I wanted to kind of highlight or have them highlight an incident that we had a week ago and, or a couple weeks ago that our fire department responded to, and I'm just going to go ahead and turn it over to him and let him explain that. Well, on August the 6th, we presented the new fire apparatus, and August the 7th, um, it was put into good use, and I'll just give you a quick background. On the night of August 7th, roughly about 8.35 at night, um, Brevard County Fire Rescue received a call on Plumosa Way in the North Indian Atlantic region for a structure fire. Upon arrival of Engine 63 from the county, they experienced very heavy fire conditions. They had a report of possibly somebody trapped inside the home. They made entry into the home, and while fighting the fire, the fire got quite out of hand, concerned about structural collapse. They declared a defensive mode of operation, but at the same time, both Tower 63 and Engine 55 were also dispatched to our mutual aid and automatic aid agreements. On arrival, Tower 63, led by Lieutenant uh, Dan Sonova and our, our one light blue shirt that we have from Brevard <laughs> County Fire Rescue. You're the odd man out, dude. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, Brian Hills from Brevard County Fire Rescue, along with uh, firefighters um, John Duba from Satellite Beach Fire Department and Eric Tippins from Satellite Beach Fire Department. They began operations in fire suppression utilizing the ladder truck. About at the same time, Melbourne Truck 74 and Satellite Beach Engine 55 were also on scene. And as soon as some of the fire was contained and conditions a little bit more safer, both of those uh, units, Engine 55, led by Commander De David Abernathy, and Truck 74 with a leader from Brevard County Fire Rescue, they began secondary search and rescue operations. Both Engine 55 and Truck 74 made it to the same the room where the occupant was found, approximately an 80-year-old female. She was found semi-conscious and barely breathing, and this was during fire operations, and they safely extricated her out of a bedroom window. That woman was transported to the hospital and actually at the hospital she went from a semi-conscious state to a conscious state and she was actually conversing with physicians. She was later flown to Shands Hospital due to smoke inhalation issues and to our knowledge she's doing quite well at this time. So what I would like to do is I'd like
like to bring these guys up here because this is one of those, I won't say once in a lifetime things, but we rarely talk about people being saved from a structure fire. So what I'd like to do is, by the way, it was engine 55, Captain Scott Manning, come on up. Firefighter EMT Eric Rose, come up and we've got his son there. Dude, come up too. You're a firefighter in training. <laughs> We have firefighter babyface Nick Walsh, <laughs> who was part of the Engine 55 crew from Tower 63, Lieutenant Dan Sanova from Brevard County Fire Rescue, and as I said, firefighter Brian Hills was unable to make it tonight for this. Firefighter EMT John Duba, firefighter paramedic Eric Tippins, and Commander David Abernathy. Um, I, like I said, you know, we talk about the good things that happen. You have the notes that you see all the time about the little things. Well, folks, this is the big thing. This is absolutely the big thing. And what makes this possible is the support from council, support from the community, and that support is in the form of apparatus, equipment, training, and personnel. And that night, though it wasn't a citizen of Satellite Beach, a citizen was benefited. And what I would like to say to our community, if we're doing this type of work outside of our city, what do you think we're doing inside of our city? I mean, and that's the system that you have created, and this is the, the basically the rewards from it. So I just want to say to these guys, No. <laughs> hold, hold on one second, please. Yeah. A lot of times, I don't think we realize what the firefighters and our safety personnel, both police and fire, go through. You know, we hear about all the good times we have to put up with. And one of our firefighters had to go through not only the up, but also went through a, a really terrible down. And Nick Walsh was with the grandmother and took her to the hospital from a boat in an accident that happened on O'Galley that you heard. So Nick, we're with you, buddy. Thank you very much for your service. I know it's tough, but we appreciate what you do. And if we can help you in any way, thank you very much. I think that's all. I just wanted to, you know, let them also know that all of our, your department heads and your residents were all just bursting with pride for everything you guys do. I mean, you guys are great. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's really nice knowing they're on duty. Yep. It is. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, moving on to agenda, excuse me, agenda item number six, discuss and take action on the right-of-way dedication. Courtney. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, as you recall, we have an issue with part of our road on Shell Street. Um, it's actually on the corner of uh, Mr. Allison's uh, property. He owns that property that's located at 1753 to 1773 Highway A1A, also known as Seaside Plaza, that has Sun, um, Sun on the Beach restaurant in it. Um, basically, we, in order to complete our project with the, re, the re reconstruction of Shell Street and the beach access is there, we really needed to get that issue uh, resolved. Um, Mr. Allison has graciously <laughs> agreed to dedicate that property to the city at no cost to us. Um, so he has done that for us, uh, and I just wanted to you know, say that we really appreciate his efforts. Um, it is 99 square feet, more or less. We've provided the... Uh, easement as well as the survey and all of the necessary items that go along with it. He has signed it, so it awaits the mayor's signature upon your approval. Move to approve the Allison and right-of-way acquisition agreement and quick claim deed for the Shell Street property. Second. I have a motion by Vice Mayor Gott, second by Councilman Brimer, <coughs> uh, for the discussion from Council. At this time, open this agenda item number six for public comment. Hearing none back. To council. Uh, Courtney, great job. Thank you very much. And uh, I know we've met with one particular, John, thank you. And we've met with some of the residents or one of the residents in particular on that street. And, uh, you know, it's working out well. And I think it'll be a great project for the city. So, any further discussion? Aaron Nunn, Lenore? Councilman Yes. Councilman Brown? Yes. 
Yes. Yes, motion carries. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, moving on to agenda item seven, discuss, take action on auditing firms contracts. Uh, thank you, Mayor. At your last meeting, you approved or you approved the selection of Car Riggs and Ingram LLC um, to issue the final audit of the city. Um, we have drafted the proposal engagement letter for their services to be executed by myself upon your approval. I'll make a motion to authorize. No, this. wait, wait. It's a, there needs to be a correction. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Mayor. Yes. Um, this one's minor. On the uh, page two, the third line from the bottom, it refers to us as the city commission that needs to change the city council. And then go to page nine, the second to the last paragraph, that one line paragraph. It says, by mutual agreement of both parties, this contract can be extended beyond the contract period outlined in this engagement letter. Well, the contract period outlined in this engagement letter is specified right at the very beginning and it goes through uh, the year 2016 with two optional years uh, for 2017 and 2018. And this one line paragraph makes it sound that this contract can then be extended by mutual agreement beyond 2018. And I don't think that's the intent. Uh, so that one sentence paragraph needs to be stricken. Okay. okay. And I'll make a motion to Authorize the city manager to approve the contract with Carter Rings, Riggs, Ingram, with the outline changes. I have a motion by Councilman Montanero, second by Councilman Brimer. Further discussion from Council? Here and then open up for public comment on this agenda item. Here and none, bring it back to Council. Uh, any further? Yeah. Lenore? Yes. 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 Motion passes. For nothing. Thank you. Uh, moving on to agenda item eight. Discuss. Uh, excuse me. I'm going to open up a public hearing uh, for agenda item eight. Discuss. Take action on resolution number 952. Jim. Resolution number 952, a resolution of the City of Satellite Beach, Brevard County, Florida, imposing an annual stormwater utility assessment for the fiscal year beginning October 1, 2014, against all real property within the city limits of Satellite Beach, Brevard County, Florida, providing for classifications of property, providing for certification of annual stormwater utility assessment role, providing an effective date. It's reading a resolution number 952. Thank you. Courtney. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, at, the, at your workshop that we had with you on July, I think it was 25th, um, we provided an outline of, of issues with our stormwater utility as well as um, the needs in terms of a rate structure. At that time, we had recommended two alternatives. One was at $85 for each equivalent res residential unit, and the other was $104 per equivalent residential unit. Um, at that time, we felt that we could step into the program of 104 being the, the need, um, that we could go to an 85 ERU, $85 ERU this year and then do it 104 next year um, as to kind of alleviate the shock of an increase to our residents. However, we are running into a lot of utility problems in terms of pipe issues that we need to work on. Um, as you recall, with this year, this proposed budget that we provided to you, um, we are actually bringing in $38,000 um, from our general fund into the stormwater utility, or we're actually just making it up in our operating expenses, um, which the stormwater utility should be paying. Um, so we are also, and because of the problems with the stormwater utility, we are paying off debt in, in maintenance only. So we have really no money to do pipe replacements or any drainage improvements. And I'd like to get ask Alan to come up and kind of give an overview of some of the recent issues that have come to light to the point where we feel it's irresponsible for us to continue with that recommendation of the step plan to you because of the problems that we're having with the um, utility in terms of the infrastructure and the need to, to fix things. Um, so we would feel that we would be irresponsible for not letting you know the issues with that. Um, so I'm going to ask Alan to kind of give you that overview. Well, um, thank you, Courtney. The <clears throat> recent rains 
you know, rains do a lot of things. They make things grow, and um, you know, they're, rain is good in a lot of ways, but it's also bad in a lot of ways where they make potholes grow and the pipe problems that are minor become major and things like that. Especially, you know, some of the aging pipes that we have in the in the city now. We've we've done a great deal of work replacing. Um, our storm drains, um, the major major problem areas, but we still have quite a few to go. And, and uh, just last week, we ran into a problem on uh, Hamlin and, and Kale, where the pipe has actually failed, and we didn't have the money to fix it outright. We were going to band-aid it um, and try to get through till next after October when the new money comes in. Um, that's how the guys put it, um, and try to get it fixed properly. But in order to fix it properly, you know, you, you have to have new pipe and possibly new structures and things like that. And if there's no money there, there's no money there. And that's just one problem that is indicative of a larger problem throughout the city. I mean, you know, any, anytime we have a, a decent rain event, you can drive down Sherwood and see that something's wrong. You can drive down um, Kale or Temple and get to around Hamlin and Sherwood and see that something's wrong. Those are the issues that we, we need to take care of. And, um, you know, there's other issues around the city, but those right there are glaring um, as when it rains. So um, the, the stormwater utility is in, in, a bad, in a bad way. And, you know, if there's some way that we can find to get a little bit more resource to work for us. I think the city and the, and the residents will see some some things being done that help alleviate the issues that, that we're seeing right now. And the other, the other thing I wanted to add is this budget year, currently we had to take funds from the capital assets program or fund and transfer them to the stormwater fund to cover debt service. And those are funds that we could use for potholes and AC, you know, the DRS centers, AC went down just this in a couple a couple weeks ago and those all cost us a lot of money um it's gotten to the point where we're doing emergency maintenance and that's very costly and it's like similar to what dr binley was saying when he was giving his presentation it's ultimately it's a costly and ultimately very inefficient way to do business um that's kind of how where we're at right now um and it I've, we really wanted to limp along until next year but given these recent events i've gotten to the point where i'm calling alan 5000 because every time he walks into my office, he costs $5,000. <laughs> um, and, and we just, I would feel remiss if I didn't let you really understand that problem and explain to you that it would be our recommendation to move forward with the 104 ERU um, because we really do need to make these replacements and repairs. Alan, how many of the, what percent of the pipes in the city you said were over 50 years old? I, it, I guesstimate sixty percent. That would be a low ball estimate. You know, they're the smaller pipes. I mean, there are some larger pipes. Don't don't get me wrong, but they're uh, the ones that that are really the the big issues right now. They're making, the, you know, causing the backups and and we're having the biggest problem with are the smaller pipes that are failing one and then they are over capacity. You know, these pipes were designed when there was a lot of empty lots around and there was a lot of green space. So now that everything's covered up, you have more water trying to get into that funnel and that, you know, you pour water into a funnel, it only can go down so quickly. So that's basically what I liken it to. Now, the piping that would be replaced, will this be compatible to our, the storm order so we will meet the next step that the state put on us on? Um, I, I don't think that we're going to yeah. solve any water quality issues with some of these repairs. I think the water quality issues are going to have to be tackled in a much broader um, way uh, because of the changes in the way um, we need to treat stormwater. You know, we used to do it with exfiltration. Now it's exfiltration plus, you know, denitrification material. So what we can do in-house with that process, we will certainly do when we're replacing things. But if 
you can only exfiltrate if you're in a certain soil type. So, I mean, there's, there's a bunch of different um, answers to your question, but, you know, we will do what we can in the process to do that. Another question. Um, Glenwood Avenue. Yes, sir. How stable is it after all these rains? Are we starting to see? Um, Glenwood, the Glenwood trunk? Um, I think the Glenwood trunk is is adequate for now, um, but the feeders into the Glenwood trunk is where we're having the problems. And that is the Sherwood area, the Sherwood Avenue area, the, the Glenwood area. Um, once we, if we can replace some of those pipes, we might also fix some backup problems. But in that, that, that trunk still needs to be either derooted and lined or replaced. Here's my reason. If you're going to start replacing all these feeder lines into it, not that it's a waste, but when you have to redo the Glenwood trunk line, is these new lines that you put in still going to be able to work oh, yeah. with the new system? Yeah. We, the, the problem is not the area that we were, we were going to replace because with the 319 that we had for the the Lori Lane trunk, mm -hmm. these are other areas that we're going to do to supplement that project. So if we can do that and then have available funds to do the Lori Lane project, I think we're getting a big bang for our buck there. Okay. Thank you. Question you know, yeah. when, you, um, when, you, when you look at the overall stormwater projects that we're looking at and how they impact the water going into the lagoon, as we do these major projects, those items are going to be addressed. But anytime we have a structural break in a line, sediment gets into the line. So you're still seeing effluent going out into the river, even in a broken line like you're talking about. Right. So when those things happen, while it's not large on the scale of stormwater, it's still allowing things to get into the lagoon system, whether it ends up in the canals or where. Absolutely. It's still stuff going in. And I noticed, you know, since we have this workshop, um, you know, I take Sherwood, I take Glenwood out Sherwood out to South Patrick, and I noticed there's cones in the road in Sherwood right there where um, Lemon comes up into it, I guess. And I could see where the depression in the road is there. So obviously that's a line that's in the midst of failure. Mm -hmm. um, it's been a depression in the road for a while, but it's definitely gotten worse over the last few months. Right. And there's a few of those where, you know, you can, what we do now is, and basically what it is, is seems the, the, uh, the pipes settle because we live on sand and the pipes end up settling and they're older and, and so, or they'll deteriorate, actually deteriorate the metal inside the pipe will deteriorate to the point where you pop holes in the pipe or you crack seams. So what we do now is we just dig them up, we wrap them with a filter fabric, and then we fill them back in, knowing that, guess what, we're going to be back here in two months to fix the next seam and then the next seam. So, you know, that's kind of like chasing your tail or the hamster in the cage doing this right here, you know, spinning around, you know, because you're, you're working your butt off, but you're not getting anywhere. Sorry for that analogy, but that's that's exactly how, you know, how it is. Further counsel? I remember when we had this discussion, uh, the $85 versus the 104, um, I think it was decided we'd, we'd go with the 85 just to, to ease folks into this uh, incremental increase. Um, but we knew then that we, we were not going to be able to see any results until the second year when we actually took it up to 104. So obviously the problem is still there, and I think that we need to address it. Uh, I know for me when you say that I met with Courtney for a, over an hour today on the issue, and uh, I think I voted for the 84 and to slowly work into it because it would be easier for people's budget. But I also didn't have the problems that popped up that we're hearing now. So, I mean, if you live on those streets that those problems occur and you expect a certain level of service, I think. And I think there's things that we just we can't turn our heads. And, uh, you know, again, it's very similar to what the school board was telling us. And it was very interesting how much more it costs when you have to piecemeal a lot of things. Mm -hmm. so. 
The only thing I can say, Alan, you remember back when we had all the hurricanes and that sort of thing and the problems that began to pop up after that. Uh, and this is probably the same equivalent amount of rain that we had back then if you look at the two periods of time. Um, and we ran into things, and of course the money was a little bit more plentiful at that point. But uh, if it keeps raining like this is, then for the next month or so, then right. we're going to be in real trouble. Um, but uh, no, I, I agree. I think we're probably going to have to look and, at funding this a little better than we were. And FEMA doesn't want to be a participant. No. Because I tried to get them to be a participant in front of Bill Spiegelhalter's house the last and after Fed. And uh, because the pipe, the pipe had failed right across Glenwood there. And I was talking to the lady from FEMA and she goes, you know what? I can look on this. I can. It, Google's a beautiful thing. <laughs> and that's when Google had just really become into prominence, you know, the, the space shots, you know, you zoom in on a street. She goes, because I got a great guy that works for me that can just pull, pull that street up. And I got a feeling that that problem was there before we got here. You know, so I couldn't sell FEMA on, on pipe problems because they knew they were pre existing, you know. So that is the issue that we face. If we have another FEI, yeah. we're going to have a lot more problems than we have now. If this increases to the 104, does this mean you're going to be able to start projects really soon in this year? Yes, we we can solve some issues. You know, we'll have, you know some. We'll have to move some people around, but yes, we'll definitely get some some. The residents will start seeing. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I was the one that was that was pretty vocal on looking at the step problem. I, I don't think we were aware of, and I spent some time with Courtney today also talking about this, and she kind of brought me up to speed on some of the things that that you're facing now, and and these weren't issues that were brought to the table when we initially talked about this. So, you know, I mean, we're going to be at 104 next year, and do we do it this year? You know, based on what I'm hearing, um, I would be okay moving in that direction and doing it now rather than waiting until next year. If there's no further comment for right now, I'll open up for public comment on agenda item, public hearing number eight. Good evening, Warren Winnick, 305 Glenwood Avenue. Um, I want to go ahead and voice my support for the increase. I did my research and I, I read the PowerPoint that was uh, available, and, um, and the, step in, the step increase seemed reasonable at the time. But sitting here and listening to you guys and really how sad our infrastructure, our water infrastructure is, I, I vote not only, I would urge you to go ahead with the 104, but even figure on a schedule and another increase next year. Okay, what makes Satellite Beach so good is our location, our beach, our river, and, um, you know, you really have to live in a box to realize that the lagoon is pretty much dying, and we are, have been contributing to it, maybe through lack of knowledge, lack of understanding of what was happening. Um, we just haven't been paying the cost, the true cost of what it takes to live here in the lagoon. And I think uh, Satellite Beach has always been a, a leader in providing na natural habitat and stuff like that. And I think we should just go ahead and bite the bullet and spend the money and make it right and do, do the things that we need to do to preserve our, our quality of life. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Floor is still open for public comment. Here, no further, bring it back to council. So we're looking for a motion to establish the rate at 104. Four. Yes, sir. Could we make a motion um, to um, approve resolution 952 with the change of the rate being 104 rather than $85? I'll second that. I have a motion by Vice Mayor Dodd, second by Councilman Montanero. For the discussion from council? No, sir. Councilman Lenore? Councilman Barber? Yes. Councilman Montero? Yes. Yes. Yes, motion carries. And somehow close public hearing and move on to agenda item nine. Discuss, take action on quarterly budget report. Thank you, Mayor. I'm going to ask our uh, assistant finance, I mean, uh, assistant city manager to come up and provide our quarterly budget report review. As you recall, we try to do these for you every quarter. Uh, this is the last one you'll see before we do our final budget amendment this year.
Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council members. Uh, as we as we've done in the past, uh, we've we typically give four financial reports uh, a year. This is the uh, third quarter financial report for fiscal year 13-14 for the city of Satellite Beach. Um, the, the the way we sort of approach the third year report being that we have to wait until after June to really have a 30 days after June to have a good idea what's in the system and then we're almost at the year end. So what I do in the third quarter report or what our staff does is really give you an idea of where we're going to be at, at year end because we're already now in August, September is the last month of the fiscal year and then the fiscal year is over. So um, what the quarterly report uh, does is it has the actuals from 12-13, looks similar to your budget. Uh, the budget for 13-14, which is your mid-year amended budget, uh, your year-to-date actuals as of 6-30, that's where we're at year-to-date. Um, and then we sort of try to do a year-end projection for the uh, city council so you have an idea where we're going to be at year-end. Just to give you some um, highlights, so, so what, I'll, what I'll stick to is kind of where we're fairly comfortable that the city will be at year-end uh, in the next month. Um, what I'll do is go over the large revenue sources in the general fund to begin with. Um, they're, they're listed in your report. Uh, but obviously the largest uh, revenue source is the ad valorem, property tax ad valorem. We're looking at $5.2 million there. We were uh, almost right on the money at our mid-year budget amendment. If you'll recall, the city in the past has um, sort of over-budgeted this uh, quite, by quite a bit in, the, in years past. And so they've always had to really wait, I think waited to the end until the audit came out. and. Um, you sort of were seventy-five thousand um, dollars in the in the red, so not a good thing. So we've straightened that out. So the next year, I think things will be easier when it comes to your budget. There'll be no major surprises, and hopefully, we can just live within the budget and go year to year after after that. So the five point two million dollars is exactly what we projected mid-year, so we're on target to meet that revenue. Uh, the share of local option gas tax, uh, we're we're going to receive about four hundred sixteen thousand. This is about $24,000 increase from the mid-year report. So we actually have some actual numbers on this. So it's probably as a result of the economy, people utilizing, uh, spending more money on fuel. Uh, reduction in the communication services tax. This is an item that has, you know, uh, been before the legislature and talked about. And, and really the, the revenue source for this has decreased over the past several years, mainly due to prepaid communication devices, such as prepaid cell phones. Those are exempt from the communication services tax. And then also, I think the carrier, this is just from what I read, but the, the carriers themselves are more competitive with their cell phone plans, which is, creates less, less uh, taxes for us. So we've, we've decreased that conservatively by $34,000 uh, from mid-year. So that was a decrease. So we're off, we were off target on that projection. Um, but if you move down to the building permit revenues, uh, we, were, we, were, we were on target there, actually projected to receive about 4,000 more than what we projected at mid-year, maybe even more than that. This is a result of the economy as well. Next slide. Uh, increase in the half-cent sales, uh, half sales tax. Uh, it's about an $18,000 increase from mid-year. And then the uh, program activities is on target, what we projected mid-year, $450,000, and that's as a result of our recreation programs. So in summary, basically from mid-year, we're uh, within $30,000 of, of revenue projection. On a $10 million budget, that's, that's pretty close. So that was a good thing. Uh, sorry about the font size here. I didn't realize it would be that small on the screen. But what I'll do is I'll go over each individual um, expense from each department. In, a legislative, in the legislative department, uh, basically there's a $10 change in the budget. You know, all the way through here, you'll see that mainly the large, uh, Mainly, most of the departments are, are under budget, or there's a few that are, you know, projected to be over. But let's be, again, these are just projections. Uh, city clerk's office uh, is within budget. Support services uh, is, is uh, over by about fifteen thousand dollars. We did bring on a a uh, comptroller position, and we did pay her more than what uh, the previous accountant made. However, it is in the same pay grade. I think you're going to see some good things come out of the finance department. Things are going to be on time, and I, and I think we're set up for, for the next several years at least in our, in our department there. Uh, and then also some costs with ADP um, that were added to our department as well. So that's kind of why that's a little bit um, over than what was that mid-year. General government services is, is within budget. The police department uh, will be under budget. The fire department will be under budget. Uh, the building and zoning department is right on budget. Public works will be under budget. Uh, the recreation department 
um, was slightly over budget, but as I look back on that, the projection was based on, we projected a year end based on the three months of the busy time in the summer where we have our part time as part of the salary. So that it was a little bit more on the salary projections. The salaries will fall in line with what was budgeted mid year. So that is a correction we'll need to make as far as our projection numbers. However, the year to date numbers are ac accurate, the 630 numbers. And the intercom transfers and then the designated fund balance uh, is right on the target as we're projected to put in approximately uh, $222,000 into our reserves again this year. So that'll push our reserves up close to a million dollars. So that's a really good thing for the city considering that just two years ago there was $35,000 in your fund balance. So the total expenditures were uh, $34,000 less because of the revenues were $34,000 less. So uh, the general fund budget um, is in line to meet the uh, mid-year projections. I don't see any, of course, any problems um, at year end. Next slide. The other funds, of course, are our uh, community services fund. That's on target. Uh, the stormwater fund, I'll show you some uh, the adjustments that are necessary in that fund. As you'll recall, uh, the city had uh, budgeted to bring in money from reserves um, after we paid off a grant uh, in one year that wasn't budgeted last year. The uh, reserve balance went to zero, so we actually had some expenses at the beginning of the year when we caught that problem. Uh, we've halted that would be the Lori Lane project. Uh, we stopped the engineering, but we still had to pay the fees during the initial couple months. So it was a good thing we caught that as early on as we did, because if we were sitting here now and can, we're continuing with that project, the money would have to come from somewhere uh, to pay for those expenses. So it's not a very large amount, but the, as, as the city manager said, the capital assets fund is going to have to make a transfer um, into that fund to help offset some of those engineering costs for the Lori Lane project, which is currently on hold. Law enforcement trust fund is, is on target. Community redevelopment trust fund um, is, is on target and the capital assets <laughs> trust fund is on target from mid-year. So uh, this really, uh, really plain and boring compared to mid-year. I think we're kind of getting some things straightened out as far as um, where our projections need to be and, and our reporting. Uh, next slide. Go to back to the stormwater fund, being that this is the one that uh, was a little bit off target. The stormwater utility fee revenue is 314000 That's what we currently collect from stormwater uh, fees. And our expenses are 350 uh, projected at year end. So you can see the difference. We don't, we're not bringing in what we're spending uh, at year end. So that, that deficit has to be made up by somewhere. And currently we propose to, that to to bring in $35,000, dollars you'll make a year in budget amendment that will bring in $35,000 from the capital assets fund uh, to offset the debt service payments for those capital projects that were previously uh, constructed. So the general fund, as the city manager said, is already paying for the maintenance. Now we need to pay for the deficit that, that, that uh, so what we have put a hold on all stormwater expenses until year end. So, uh, next year, with the council's approval tonight, uh, I think we'll be able to straighten those those issues out in the stormwater fund and, and continue to do the, the projects that are needed. So the, in summary, uh, city departments have made the necessary adjustments to balance the budget despite significant decreases to revenues at mid-year. If you remember at mid-year, stormwater once again, we had projected to bring in 100000 for the maintenance from the stormwater fund. Uh, and we had to come up and, and cut back on the expenses to make up that shortfall. So we successfully did that. Uh, the projections show an increase in year-end reserves of 222,000. Uh, represents a proposed increase of 222,633 dollars from mid-year. That's that's a projection. It's set to change, but we're on target. Um, I think the periodic review presentations and transparency of financial reporting has allowed the city council to stay abreast of the financial conditions of the city and make adjustments as necessary throughout the fiscal year. So I think by doing these reports and, and being so thorough with them and, and making these projections kind of gives everybody a good feeling on where we're heading and what changes need to be made. So I think we're the city council and city manager has really stayed on top of the finances for the city. And uh, looking ahead, uh, city staff will begin the preparation for the 13-14 uh, financial audit already again. Uh, you just approved the contract for our auditors, so we'll begin working with them uh, to uh, get the 13-14 audit together. And then your year-end budget amendment, which will be in the next several months. Uh, we have 60 days after the end of the fiscal year to amend the budget. Uh, that will take place. Um, 
and uh, it'll be similar probably to the projections here. There may be a few small changes, uh, but overall the city is within their budget, and the big thing is, once again, the city's funding the, the city's reserve. So um, with that being said, I'll answer any questions. I do know there were some questions regarding some of the expenditures. I, I did notice in the police department, uh, the mayor had a question. Um, the year-to-date actuals is basically right off the system, so we do from time to time make journal entries. If we post something to the wrong account, we have to go back and repost it. So if the year-to-date actual is more than the year-end projection, there probably is a reason for that. Um, there are some things that in the police department that, that I do need to look at, but the overall uh, budget for the police department, I'm confident the city will be within that at year-end. Um, Andy, thank you very much. I have a couple just to get... On page 30, if you would look at the line item that says other benefits to for the actual to year projected, I think those numbers are probably could be transposed or something. On that line, it says the actual was 24,092 yes. and the year end projected 19,501. Yes. Okay, and then on page 34, uh, under internet, also the same thing. Same situation, I believe we, yeah. we've made a journal entry. That'll need to be moved, a portion of that, to the police department okay. budget. We just charged it to that line item and needs to be corrected. 37 on the dispatch, the police, you said dispatch differential, which we went through that. Yes. And then on page 48, uh, donation beautification trust, mm -hmm. I think the same thing. Yes. Okay. Any further questions from? I'd just Council? like to make a comment. Um, Andy, there's really been a huge improvement in finance uh, since you've been on board. And um, I know that as one council member, I have a lot of confidence in the reports that you give us. And I really appreciate your effort. Thank you very much. I'll pass that along. Good. Further questions? No. At this time, open up for public comment. Hearing on back to the council. I'll make a motion to accept the third quarter budget report. Second. I have a motion by Councilman Montanero, second by Vice Mayor Gott to accept the, the report. Um, Andy, I just want to say thanks, buddy. About yeah, time you got back to work, though. And, uh, <laughs> it's, it's my job. I hope Thank the you. vacation was good. <laughs> Limmer? Yes. 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 Yes, motion carries. Thank you. So, you, staff, thank you very much. Moving on to... In agenda item 10. Yes. Um, discuss, take action, up, update regarding medical marijuana. <laughs> Good evening. We uh, have an update, if you will, uh, more of uh, some information to allow the council to give some direction on the, the uh, potential for the medical marijuana law to be passed in November. And it was our, um, it was our thought to uh, get together with the city manager and present some information to you in an effort to try to get a, a little direction on if this were to pass, what would you like us to research as far as what direction would you like to go in regards to dispensaries and um, locations and things like that. Uh, basically, like the, uh, the pill mill ordinances and other cities around the area are uh, getting out in front of it, for lack of a better term, to make sure that when and if the law passes, the city is comfortable with its position on who can do what where in the city of Satellite Beach. And so really, that's what we're doing. We, uh, Lieutenant, uh, still can't get past that, Commander Berrios has done a lot of research and is going to give a uh, very brief presentation of some information. We don't have every answer to every question. Uh, we tried to get some information as far as what's going on in the area, what other people are doing, a few options that you have, and really, the, again, the purpose of this is to just give whatever information we can in a relatively short period of time and just get a little direction from the, uh, from the council as far as uh, where you would like to see us focus our att attention and research for the future. Good evening. Um, as the Chief is saying, it looks like the medical marijuana uh, amendments actually going to go through. It seems like everything I've gone through on the Internet seems to be going towards medical marijuana. 
uh, is going to be actually approved in Florida, as other states have. Uh, so what I did is I just put together some points, and I believe you have in your pa uh, package. And I'd just like to go right down the line on them, on the types of marijuana usage that we'll be uh, dealing with, the uh, medical marijuana, uh, which is prescribed to patients with debil debilitating diseases, although states, it also states that, uh, or excuse me, in states that have legalized medical marijuana, they're also allowing patients with minor pains to also take marijuana. Medical marijuana is often sold at sto storefront dispensaries and not pharmacies. So it's not something that uh, you just have a prescription for and go to the pharmacy. You actually get it from a storefront dispensary, which is something that we want to try to see if either one can be banned or we'll have to pay, uh, put some restrictions on as far as where we want to have them here in, in, uh, in satellite. Uh, as far as recreational marijuana, although the public view on marijuana is wa wavering somewhat, the fact remains that it's still considered a gateway drug, especially to the youth. Uh, with the introduction now of also e-cigarettes, the chance of juveniles uh, abusing is even higher than what it was before. Uh, these electronic instruments claim to be odorless and almost undetectable. Uh, federal law basically states that cultivation, distribution, and possession of marijuana is prohibited other than to engage in federally approved uh, research. But contra contrary to the law, 18 states and the District of Columbia currently uh, exempt medical marijuana users from penalties. Colorado and Washington also legalize small amounts for recreational use to individuals over the age of 21. In states where marijuana has been legalized for medical purposes, more than 90 percent of those approved are for common ailments like back and neck pains, cramps, muscle spasms, not the debilitating uh, diseases they were intended for like AIDS, cancer, and ALS. Uh, if it is approved in Florida, uh, the wording or the, the word is that there's only five growers who meet certain criteria in the state of Florida can actually uh, manufacture, process, and distribute the product. And they have to be nurseries that have been in business for at least 30 years. Uh, as far as we know, we don't have any nurseries in the city that fall onto that, but that's still just wording. We don't know if that's what the state of Florida is going to go with. The amendment overview uh, basically is a ballot summary states that the that the, it is only for those with debilitating diseases, but also states that it will be acceptable for other conditions for which a doctor believes that the use of medical marijuana would outweigh the potential risk to the patient. This language could open the door to widespread use for marijuana of marijuana med medical marijuana, um, as uh, stated for minor ailments, back, neck pains. Uh, Prescription is not required, as stated earlier. Uh, all they need is a physician's certification. This is not a form of prescription. This is a written recommendation that is used to go to the storefront dispensaries to buy your marijuana. Uh, the amendment does not address parental consent, so according to us, it's not required. Unlike other states with medical marijuana laws, amendment does not provide an age limit, nor does it require parental consent for minors' access to medical marijuana. Background checks for caregivers is not required. Caregivers are described in the amendment, in the amendment are not required to have background checks, training, or certification. This loophole could open the door for abuse by allowing addicts, drug dealers, and convicted felons to, be care, to become caregivers. Today's marijuana is a lot more potent than what it was in the past. In the 60s and 70s, the THC level of marijuana was about 9%, I mean, excuse me, 1%. Back in 83, it was about 4 percent. It is currently up to 11 percent. And that, I mean, that shows you how it's gone up. And now with the e-cigarettes are coming out for smoking pot, uh, and for the states of the criminalizing possession, a variety of these companies are sprouting up uh, and selling actually e-cigarettes that are just for marijuana. These things are a hybrid between a joint and an e-cigarette as in, uh, in that you can actually put the dry herb into the e-cigarette and take it to the point of combustion and then just put it away. Once again, these things are basically marketed as undetectable and uh, also that your product lasts a little longer because as soon as you let go of the little ignition, which is battery operated, it stops burning or stops vaporizing, so you get to keep a lot more of your product with you, which gives you a longer term high. 
once again no lighter no smell and no smoke uh, is one of the other things that they're basically saying that uh, I saw one of the uh, articles that I read online where a gentleman said that he drew, he rode a train from Baltimore to New York for work and the whole time he was hitting on his e-cigarette well for his marijuana and that he was never detected by anyone as smoking it and that's one of the things that we're in law enforcement especially or you know something that we're gonna have to go up against because as these e-cigarettes and this medical marijuana comes out and eventually what we believe is the overall thing that's gonna happen the recreational use I mean this is gonna be something for us to actually have to deal with in our community uh, the security issues that we'll have to deal with is if we do have any dispensaries in the city we're gonna have to really focus on these dispensaries because they become magnets for crime uh, you get people that just want to rob the places if not the patrons and then the fact also that you have you can have less than honest workers and patients that will make backdoor deals as soon as they get their medical marijuana they're making a deal to sell it to someone else uh, whether it's a child or whoever it may be um, ban oh, banning dispensary excuse me thank you chief. Yes, sir. Um, the amendment does not address banning any dispensaries in the state of Florida, although in California, you know, back in 2013, the, their Supreme Court went ahead and said that their counties and municipalities could ban uh, medical marijuana dispensaries, uh, but on the flip side, and I believe it was Michigan, uh, their Supreme Court states that the municipalities and counties cannot. So we don't know where Florida is going to fall in line as far as whether they'll allow the city to ban it or not. And if not, then I imagine we would have to do something at least to make it more restrictive to make sure they're away from our schools, make sure they're away from our kids. Uh, unfortunately, it just looks like it's going to pass. It's just how we need to uh, actually look at it to attack it and, and keep it away from our kids and our youth. Thank you very much. Um, input from council. Question, Jim, can we um, say pharmacies only and then at least a start until we got a ruling on that? I haven't really looked at it yet. Um, I mean, we, the city adopted the, um, the pill mill stuff and we establish our own regulations for it and if I mean I haven't really sat down to look at any of this any of this stuff but based on what the commander said was it sounds like the ability for the city to regulate is there um, I'd have to read whatever the Supreme Court cases were from California and Michigan to find out why or how they interpreted their particular because it may have, it may be predicated completely on how the the ballot measure was approved the language it was actually in the ballot measure so you know I, I can't give you a, a specific answer right now but just in the idea of being able to regulate I, I you know my understanding of the the referendum item is is that that is still open you know and then you got the other issue is what is the legislature going to do and if and how it may preempt the issue which we don't know that yet either what is the ballot language going to be I, I haven't gone through and read it. I mean, they've got the summary, which is the 15 words, and I haven't gone through to look at the actual language of it. Well, the, 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 the amendment, actually, I have a copy of. doesn't really, I mean, I can test it up to the city manager and everything. I don't think, I just found this online just today, so I'm not sure if I've got this, a copy of this to the council, but... Um, it just, it just addresses medical tr uh, marijuana treatment centers, but doesn't really say what they do other than cultivating. And also, the, so that's one of the scares also is that it doesn't really say how many and what is actually considered a medical marijuana cultivating center. Could it be, you know, some places like California, I think they even have where people can grow plants in their homes. Um, you know, five plants per family. But, That's but, not going to be the ballot language. Though. No, 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 no. The ballot language, I'm not sure this is the amendment to the medical marijuana. I mean, this, the language on the ballot, I'm not sure if that's the same as the what the amendment is. My, my understanding of what the ballot's actually about is, is just simply to allow 
Right. What's the language? Debilitating medical yes. condition, and then whatever right. the Perfect. other um, language is about weighing the balance between what the medical condition is and the detriment. Right. And then, you know, and that's why I'm saying, though, it's ultimately going to in part boil down to what the legislature does and how much it's going to decide it's going to preempt the field of regulation. So, but I mean, there's, at this point, there's no reason for the city not to at least take a position on how it would like to proceed with it. You know, we've, we've already regulated adult entertainment in this city. We've already regulated the pain mill issue. And one of the policy committees, in fact, at the annual conference, um, my wife, Barb, who was our former city clerk, came, and um, she was a registrant. I paid for her to attend the conference. She went to the policy committee meeting to discuss this. And, and basically, we can look at this and we can regulate this. And the Florida League of Cities is looking at working with the legislature to address some type of legislation that would be a blanket type scenario for all cities. Well, with that being said, if whatever we do is stricter than whatever that is, based on the fact that we've had it in place, our ordinance would hold up even with whatever the League of Cities ultimately comes up with with the legislature. So if our intent is to put us in a situation where we are with adult entertainment and with the pain, you know, places, then I think we should probably try to move in that direction and take a position on it so that if what the Florida League of Cities and the legislature come up with is something that's not going to be compatible for what we want to see for our city, then we've already got something in place. Well, um, I attended, like I said, I attended the taxation uh, committee. And the big discussion there is what's going to happen with all the money that comes off of this. And that's nobody's figured that out either. Where is it going to go if it's sold here and that sort of thing? Um, but the, going around the room, there's several several cities there, obviously. And they, some of them are way far ahead of this. matter of fact, I was sitting next to Carol McCormick, and that's how we ended up with the Palm Shores ordinances. I asked her for it, just included it in our packet. Um, so I, I do think, Jim, we can regulate it in some way. I, you know, I think we need to take a look at how we want to regulate. That'd be my opinion on this. And some of it got the conversation towards the end. They finally wrapped it up. It got kind of bizarre. I mean, they were there were some cities that were trying to figure out how they were going to deal with the fact that the, the medical marijuana is not for me or my family. It's for my pet. I'm dead. Yeah, that's everybody's reaction. Is that it's, it, it's for my my German Shepherd, I give it to the dogs. I mean, you know, and then there's also the problems that all the animals in the house are a little bit dysfunctional because of that. So this is a much bigger issue than just me buying it or Frank buying it or whatever. It's for my pet. And so that, I mean, I don't know how you're going to deal with that, guys. Really well, the other the other issue, which I don't know if it's, I don't recall that it's addressed, but I, but some of the other states, from what I understand, is is it's not just the marijuana; it's the THC, and they're right. they're actually doing liquid THC. So that's another aspect of this whole thing too. Yeah. Which may go to the pet's part, I guess. But I don't know. It was bizarre. Mark, would this stop Indy from barking? <laughs> we can <laughs> run it as a test, Lorraine. If it is, sign me up. Turn it over to Jeff and let him work that problem. Just, just, he would just bark really, really slowly. <laughs> In the past, with the adult entertainment and the pill mills, we took a pretty strong stand. So uh, I think we could direct Jim to go on that type of scenario how we did the last two and come up with something taking a look at other people's what Cocoa Beach and so forth did and see how it fits us. You, you have a big correlation between the pain management clinics and the dispensaries in my opinion yeah. and you saw Cocoa Beach's ordinance did capitalize on their previous pain management clinic ordinance and kind of just made them both the same which may be an option for us since we already have a pain management clinic ordinance. I don't think outlawing them entirely is an option in Florida, personally. They've never, our state has never allowed us to do anything like that. Um, so I would, I would recommend you know, going down that path of making those very similar ordinances. How has the pain um, clinic um, ordinance been for the police department? Is it working? Absolutely perfectly. The, uh, it's, it's working exactly as designed. It's being complied with to the letter. 
It's not been issue one. Uh, and if, if I could, just as a quick summary, uh, I believe from what I'm hearing, we do not want to be the test city that, that says let's completely ban it and be the, the case that goes to the Supreme Court that decides what Florida is going to be, if that's what I'm understanding. Uh, the second thing it would be then is to somewhat tailor that, yes, if this passes, then yes, they are, could be available in Satellite Beach based on some general restrictions similar to the, to the, uh, the pill mill ordinance. And I think with that direction, uh, that would be a, a, a good place to start, and we can come back with something then. Uh, the city attorney can come back w in collaboration with something that gets us in the process, like uh, like you said, because what Councilman Montanero mentioned, which is very important, is it, it ha I have read and heard similar in information. It's important enough to just highlight one last time, that if we do get something in place, then when and if the state comes through and it passes and then there's other legislations and regulations, ours more often will, will stay put and be grandfathered in, for lack of a better term, because it's already done, ready, and on the books. So it, it wouldn't be a bad idea to do what we're doing now, continue progressing, get out in front of it, and come up with something. I just have one more comment. Because we talk, I keep talking about the THC levels, and there's some um, states that have regulated that. So that might be something we won't, might want to bring to the attention of the League of Cities as something that we want the legislature to address because they're ultimately going to have to, to put their two cents in and we, we might have to do adjustments to our ordinance at that time. But um, the THC level in some states are re highly regulated where they are required to submit to tests and, and it's kind of like surprise tests from, you know, I think it's the health department that has to do that. So there, there may be ways to address that fear and, and keep that issue at bay. So that might be something we want to bring up to their attention when we go to our committee meetings. Okay. At this time, I'll open up for public comment on this agenda item. Here and on back to council. I think they're stoned. <laughs> And I'm not on this. So you've got enough direction? Yes. Okay. okay, thank you. Moving on to agenda item 11. First will be the City Council workshop meeting, August 27th at 7 p.m. Stop right there. <laughs> We need to um, postpone the handbook workshop. I'm proposing that it move to September the 24th. I have been inundated with writing projects. Uh, the next thing that's due is the budget, which I'm editing. City manager wants to try for that award again. Um, after that, I need to get that uh, special edition Beachcaster. And then I can turn my attention back to the handbook. I have just um, spent a huge amount of time on that redevelopment plan, correcting the errors, finding them, correcting them. Um, so my plate is full, and I just can't. Uh, and, and that's the only one of these that's really an arbitrary uh, deadline. So we need to, to move it. To the 24th? 24th. Is that Finally, with everybody's schedule? I, I'm open. Okay. So we're 7 o'clock on the 24th? September 24th? Yes. Okay. Okay, then going on to agendas for the City Council meeting September 3rd. Courtney? Um, as you recall, you will be approving your budget first reading during this period. We will be coming to you with a grant request um, to apply for a grant for the sports field lighting. And then we'll be adding the redevelopment plan adoption first reading ordinance on this agenda item. Um, one that is one that <laughs> Councilwoman God has, or Vice Mayor God has put a lot of time in um, helping us get that in order. So that's actually being presented to the advisory committee tomorrow night in CPAB on the 25th, and then it'll come to you on the 4th for, or I mean on the 3rd for first reading, and on the uh, 17th for second reading. And that's it. Okay. Like I've said before, if there is any other additional items that needs to be on it, please see myself and Courtney on that. Okay. Okay, moving on to agenda item 12, adoption of minutes. I'll make a motion to adopt the July 24th workshop meeting, the August 6th workshop meeting, and the August 6th 
regular council meeting as submitted. Second. I have a motion by Councilman Montanaro, second by Vice Mayor Gott. Any discussion? Here in Nunlanor? Councilman Barnard? Yes. Vice Mayor Gott? Yes. Councilman Montanaro? Yes. Mayor Tina? Yes, motion passes. Um, one subject to bring up, um, at this time, since the qualifying is over and we know who will fill in the seats, this Steve, is Steve on the list to get the packets? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Any further? And we expect you to memorize them, too. Well, like there will do. be a test. <laughs> He's already been giving do, <laughs> jobs right now. He's okay. already getting jobs. Yeah. Okay. Great. Any further business? Hearing none, meeting adjourned.